This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 10, Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through chapter 6, verse 6. Jairus' daughter, rejection at home. We're continuing uh, in, in Mark chapter 5, uh, but before we do, I'd like to maybe take a little bit chance to give a brief note about the Gentiles in the Gospel of Mark with the uh, Legion demoniac episode of Mark chapter 5, verse 1 through 20. That was our first uh, interaction with a, a Gentile in the Gospel of Mark. And it's probably a good opportunity here to give us just some um, hint of how Gentiles function uh, in, the sto- in the Gospel. Kelly, uh, Kelly Iverson has written this book called Even the Dogs Under the Table, where she traces the, um, the Gentile characters, if you will, or character groups. And there are potentially 11 there are uh, indications with Gentiles. Uh, one, crowds by the sea may be in Mark chapter 3. Um, the Gerizim demoniac, which we just saw in Mark chapter 5. Syrophoenician woman in Mark 7. The deaf man uh, right after that in Mark 7. The feeding of the 4,000 uh, in, in Mark 8. The blind man uh, in Mark, later in Mark 8. The father with the demon-possessed son in Mark 9. Of course, Pilate, the soldiers the Roman soldiers at the, at, the, at the cross, Simon of Cyrene, and then lastly, the centurion. Those are uh, the, the Gentiles that come into the story. Each of these encounters are unique. Even those where Jesus does a, a similar deed, there clearly are differences, spatial, temporally, um, and there are tidal details that show that these are not the same story. No two episodes are exactly like. Interesting enough, um, a Gentile character doesn't get that is introduced doesn't reappear later in the narrative. I mean, we've had uh, you know the the twelve and the religious leaders and the apostles that that you know, obviously appear all the way throughout. But a Gentile episode seems to be a, a standalone. But one of the things I think is, is fascinating because again, going from the idea that Mark is selectively choosing what he puts in his gospel, is that. There is some uh, uniformity, or at least similarity, in Mark's presentation of his Gentile characters. In other words, um, he presents them uh, in, in, a very, in a very similar way, though not in a stereotypical fashion. They are certainly individual. But the typical presentation of the Gentiles are positive. Not, not, not exclusively so. But in general, they, they are presented in a positive light. Even when you think of Pilate. Pilate in the Gospel of Mark have, has a bit of a more positive presentation, if one can say that, than uh, in some of the other Gospels. The Gentiles uh, will often show some form of desperateness in some form. Uh, some sort of need that Jesus looks to fill. Maybe it's sickness, disease, demonic possession, or other physical ailments. In other words, Mark shows the Gentiles as being plagued with the same problems as the Jews, sometimes perhaps even in greater severity, if you think of the the demoniac that we just talked about. The the demon-possessed boy in in chapter 9, the disciples can't exercise it, though they had some success in other situations, may suggest, suggest the severity of the demon. You have this Gentile, that crowd that had followed Jesus for three days in chapter 8. You have the Syrophoenician woman, the deaf man, the blind man, they're all desperate. And in a sense, they, their desperateness is also for a deeper need of salvation. We see faith in the Gentiles. A belief and trust is found among many of the Gentile individuals in the gospel, both in action and in deed. You see uh, a response, in other words, by the Gentiles that are very similar to response by certain Jews and often in contrast with many Jews, uh, the Jewish leadership specifically that reject Jesus. There's an understanding, the Gentiles seem to show some understanding of the mysteries of the kingdom. 
The Syrophoenician woman, for example, is the only character to hear and seemingly understand one of Jesus' parables without having to have it explained. She understands that Gentiles are not excluded from God's purposes, though priority is given to the Jews. The healing of the deaf and the blind man, the Gentile deaf and Jeff, Gentile deaf man and Gentile blind man might underscore the abilities of of the Gentiles to come to understand. Of course, 1521, Simon of Cyrene carries the cross, which is, I think, connected with the model of discipleship presented in Mark chapter 8. And of course, the centurion gives the quintessential confession at the cross that the centurion, which we'll speak to more later, is the first human, if you will, in, in the Gospel of Mark, to understand who Jesus is without there being any correction or silencing. So we see then that with the Gentiles, like the Jewish people, that the Gentiles are, have a need, a same need, a similar need, and that Jesus also cares and responds to those needs. Prior to the Passion narrative, all the Gentiles mentioned received Jesus' compassion. Though they might be outsiders to Israel, politically or cultically understood, they are not outsiders to God's family. He heals them, feeds them, exercises demons in the same way as he does the Jews. We see accounts in the Gospel of Mark of Jesus receiving Gentiles in the Jewish homeland, as well as him intentionally traveling to Gentile lands. We just saw saw that in, uh, recently. We see um, uh, also, though, disobedience. On three occasions, we do have some measure of disobedience by Gentiles. After the healing of the deaf man, for example, in chapter 7, the Gentile crowds disobey God's command not to tell. The irony is, in their disbelief, the Gentiles are also... Um, and that first group to make some sort of messianic proclamation. There's an interplay between what they're saying and their disobedience. Is a bit of an irony there. The Gentiles are included among a group that's called an adulterous generation. Uh, we'll see that later on in the Gospel of Mark. They are put in a similar position as the Jews in 812. There is, in chapter 10, 42 through 45, this contrast uh, between Gentile leaders and Jesus and this argument that develops among the disciples about who's going to be great. And in, in, we see places, too, where Jesus rebukes and, and seems to rebuke everyone, not just Jewish people. Pilate, of course, ultimately doesn't believe. Gentiles, Jesus is handed over to Gentiles for judgment at the Passion. The people... Uh, uh, or in fear of Jesus at the at, you know the demoniac legion exorcism we looked at and asked him to leave. So there are negative aspects for the Gentiles' role, but the negatives pale in Mark in comparison to the positives. And so I think one of the things that we see then in the way the Gentile are used in the Gospel of Mark is that uh, there is generally a positive thrust that's occurring that the structure of Mark's gospel has this move of the kingdom of God beginning to go to the Gentiles in chapter 5, verse 1 through 20, with even this hint of the mission where the now restored man is instructed to go tell people that this is, will eventually lead up to the centurion making this proclamation. You have this positive feel. Even, even in the uh, cleansing or cursing of the temple, which we'll talk about Later, when, when Jesus responds and accuses the leadership of, of saying, my uh, house was to be a house of prayer, um, um, but you have made it into a den of thieves, what's interesting is, in Mark, it's my house was to be a house of prayer for the nations. Now, when we look at some of the other Gospels, it doesn't have the for the nations part. It, just, it ends at a house of prayer. But Mark makes sure we have the full quote, which is, the for the nations, indicating there also this welcoming and inclusion of the Gentiles. And so I think that there is, in the Gospel of Mark, this positive attention given to the Gentile response, not in a situation as if somehow the Gentiles are better than uh, the, the, the Jewish people, but rather almost a, a sameness. The Gentiles are suffering in the same way the Jewish people are suffering. 
And Jesus is going to the Jewish people as well as to the Gentile people. But there is a slight difference in that the Gentile people seem to be more positively responding to the message in a way that certainly the Jewish leadership at least was not. And so, to some extent, you know, to use uh, the, the, the language of crumbs for the dogs, there's this idea that the dogs uh, it may wait for the crumbs to fall, but by the end of the Gospel of Mark, they no longer have to wait for the children to drop it, but they've even become children themselves. So as we look into the Gospel of Mark and the Gentiles, let's, I want us to keep that in mind, um, how the Gentiles are, are functioning in the Gospel of Mark. All right, let's continue uh, to, to, to move on um, in, in our account. And so we get to uh, chapter 5 now and verses 21 through 43. It's interesting, this is the second of Mark's inter Collations, or the, the Mark and Sandwich, where a story begins, and then in the middle of that telling of the story is a uh, second story that's told in full, and then the first story concludes itself. Now, this Mark and Sandwich isn't um, as striking, if, as you will, as the one with the, the family of Jesus, and then the controversy with Beelzebul and returning to the family of Jesus. Uh, those are clearly two separate events. Here, the, the, the meat of the story, uh, you have uh, the uh, account that begins with Jairus' daughter uh, and the pleading that Jesus would come uh, and, and help her. Uh, and then that's interrupted by the story of the woman with the bleeding disorder and then the return of the story of Jairus' daughter. In a lot of ways, it does still function as one story because it's the, the, the events with the woman with the bleeding disorder are along the way. Um, but there is still this structure of, of a split story telling. Interesting enough, when you look at the story of the uh, Jairus daughter and the story of the bleeding uh, woman with the bleeding disorder, there is a common theme. There's a common theme of faith involved in both. There's the common uh, use of 12 years of time. The woman suffers for 12 years. The young girl is 12 years old. Both episodes concern females. Both have ceremonial impurity, the blood and bleeding disorder of the woman and the death of the girl. But there's also a difference. Uh, uh, the One is a Jewish male leader in the community, a synagogue leader who comes to Jesus. The other is a poor woman, outcast, ceremonial, impure. So there's some interesting uh, interplays uh, between. And so instead of sort of reading through, as we have been, I'm going to start the story one, discuss it, and then we'll look at the bleeding woman, and then we'll finish the story of uh, Jairus' daughter. So when Jesus um, had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, so we've had this, it's on one side of the lake, he goes across it, there's a storm, he gets to the other side, there's the legion demoniac, he leaves, now he's crossed back over. Um, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. This again consistent with what we've been seeing in terms of his popularity. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there. Interesting enough, because to now, now a synagogue leader, a synagogue ruler was an administrator of the synagogue, one who probably made sure that worship uh, uh, was orderly and the functions of the synagogue were proper. Up to this point, religious leaders have tended to be on the outside. And here we have a religious leader who's coming to him to plead for need. And I think this is good because I think this also indicates that there, not all the leaders of Israel have rejected Jesus. It hasn't been a wholesale full rejection that there are some who are still coming to him. It also speaks to the recognition and popularity of Jesus to be able to do amazing and wonderful miracles uh, that he, he comes here. Interesting enough, too, is uh, it's very unusual to have an individual named in a miracle story. Think of the miracle stories that we've had already. It was, it was usually uh, the, the state of the affair. No name was given. The paralyzed man, the blind man, the deaf man. Uh, and so forth. Here we actually get a name of an individual involved, Jairus. In fact, only here and then Bartimaeus, uh, 
and Mark 10 are the only time that we have individuals named. Now, this could be, I mean, for a couple of reasons. One thing is, rhetorically, you tended to name your friends. Uh, you know, so friends' names tend to get remembered. Uh, and so this may be an indication of a figure who was remembered later on. And, and the audience, even at the reception, would have known of, of Jairus or, or some connection. Also speaks to the historicity of the event, that this isn't a caricature. This is a specific individual. And perhaps even speaks to the amazing nature that the, the miracle that's going to happen with his daughter being resuscitated back to life was of such um, uh, a volatile event that the story could not be hardly even told without mentioning the person involved. Regardless, it's fascinating that we get the name mentioned. And so we, we have this uh, a situation, seeing Jesus, he fell at his feet. Um, and again, we need to be careful here because falling at his feet doesn't indicate worship. It indicates uh, you know, here pleading, pleading to someone who is in, who could do something that Jairus could not. So here's a synagogue ruler pleading at the feet of a man who is causing lots of controversy in synagogues pleading at his feet to come do something. There's a desperate need. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Now, that's where uh, the story of Jairus um, and and, and his, his daughter begins. Now, this story gets interrupted. We get an event that happens into the middle of this story with this bleeding woman. Now, a large crowd followed and pressed around him, and a woman who was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. So we have this picture of this woman, this condition, and it's very pitiful. One is she's uh, perpetually bleeding, uh, though, uh, though, though not mentioned specifically, uh, it's largely assumed that this condition was likely some sort of menstrual bleeding, which would have also made her ceremonial unclean. She would have been unable to participate in some of the religious life. It's, she, her poverty is made known. It uh, speaks to how she spent everything she had on this. There was a desperate nature to have this restored and every every bit of her money was spent towards trying to get it solved and yet uh, there's been no human success i mean this one of the setting is no human doctor was able to restore that in fact her situation was getting worse um, it's been often remarked uh, and i find it amusing i'll share it with you here that uh, when luke tells this story uh, luke doesn't mention doctors uh, unable to do something, and, and, and we have always, some people have always joked that maybe Luke just doesn't want to demean his profession. Um, regardless, uh, we, we see Mark tells us clearly that she has sought help from others uh, who are the supposed experts in the field um, and has been unable to receive any relief. And so here, uh, this, this woman who's ceremonially unclean, who is impoverished, uh, who is uh, would be an outsider, if you will, in, in a lot of ways, disenfranchised. Has been, and when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Now, we've, we've talked about this, that this idea of touching clothing to heal uh, is uh, not an uncommon thought or superstition, and, and that that somehow the power would be uh, available and somehow infused into the clothing. We see this with the Apostle Paul and his handkerchiefs uh, and, and Acts, Peter and his shadow. And, and so she, she says, I want to touch because her, she uh, believes if she touches the clothes, she'll be healed. And, and immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. It's a fascinating account here. So similar to other miracle accounts in, in the Gospel of Mark, there's an immediacy. She, she'd been bleeding for 12 years. No one could stop the bleeding. Now she touches Jesus' cloak. She immediately is made whole. 
Now, a difference, though, is that in the other accounts, the other miracles, and even like Jairus, the person has come to Jesus and has made their concern known, has made their need known, and has, has um, had a muscular response to their belief, pulling apart the roof to let the paralyzed man down, and so forth. She, she hasn't made her situation known to Jesus. She has just gone to Jesus for healing. And so then I think that helps explain what happens, what happens next. At once Jesus realized the power had gone out from him. He turned in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? The disciples, of course, uh, find the question absurd uh, because they say, Don't you see the people crowding against you? Uh, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? Uh, there's a sense of everyone's touching you, Jesus. What do you mean, who touched? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Now, given what we know about Jesus already in the Gospel of Mark, and I think it's important to keep in mind, we know Jesus has the power to understand thoughts. We know Jesus has the perspective of God on the hearts. So the, the, the picture here then, I don't think should be of Jesus... Uh, asking this question and looking around because he has no idea what has just happened and he wants an answer because he is surprised as anyone else is. I think the sense is he has stopped the moment and is now created a situation that will force this woman to make a muscular demonstration of her faith. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Notice how this continues to happen now. How frequently we've had people falling at the feet of Jesus. There is a recognized authority here. Fell at his feet, trembling with fear. Once again, fear. We've had fear from the disciples on the boat. We've had fear from uh, the, the people who witnessed what had happened with the demoniac legion, and now we have fear from this woman. And fear here is, is, is clearly within this state of uh, this idea of in the Old Testament of fear, of, a, uh, of the right and proper awe and response in the presence of a power that doesn't make sense on a human realm, that only makes sense on the divine. And so she has fear and told him the whole truth. Uh, and probably I think the whole truth uh, not only is... Uh, her symptoms and how long she's had them, but also why she wanted to touch him. And perhaps it was because of her state of uncleanliness uh, that she uh, didn't even want to make known her presence uh, to Jesus, didn't want to make known the fact that she was going to try to touch him because that meant impurity remember, contaminates purity. We saw that with the leper, but how in the idea of and then in the ceremonial understanding of cleanliness that if one was touched by something impure, they became impure and had to then go be ritually restored. Uh, so maybe there was even some, some concern there. Of course, as with the man with leprosy and with the woman with the bleeding disorder, it is Jesus' purity that is the stronger, not, not the impurity. So she tells the whole story. And, and he said to her, daughter. Now, this is uh, the only place where Jesus addresses someone as daughter uh, in the gospel. It's a very uh, tender statement, similar to what he says to the paralyzed man in Mark 2, where he calls him son. And so there is a uh, familial intimacy. Remember when, uh, when the, uh, the family of Jesus thought Jesus was crazy and they were trying to get him to stop what he was doing, and Jesus said, you know, here are my mothers and my daughters and my brothers and he looks at the people anyone who does the will of god uh and and so there's this connection here between what G, what this woman has just done in demonstrating a faith not only to touch but also to uh come out and um uh state uh her, you know who who why she touched him uh what drove that uh, to happen and her um telling of the whole story, that he responds by saying, you now belong to my family very tenderly. And of course, there's also an interplay here with Jairus. Jairus has come because of a concern over his daughter. And here in this uh, middle of the story, Jesus is calling this woman daughter. 
So then, then this 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 bit, you know, has occurred. This uh, uh, this meat in the Markin sandwich, uh, if you will, and and he says, uh, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. This idea of going in peace, uh, you're now in a right relationship, um, uh, and and no longer are outside. Then while Jesus was still speaking, some men from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler, right, that story comes back into the picture, says, your daughter is dead. So Jairus has been there, um, I want to perhaps anxiously so, because now there's been this delay. Your daughter is dead, why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, don't be afraid, interesting, don't be overcome by your fear, just believe. Here, though, the fear is not a don't have a godly fear, but rather don't have a human fear. And, I, and it's hard not to think about the panic of the disciples in the boat who, because of the circumstances, were afraid. What they did wrong was be afraid and wake up Jesus. They didn't trust. They didn't believe. In this moment, which Mark, I believe, is connecting, and we're to, we're to see this, that Jesus says to, to Jairus, don't have a human fear, have faith. You know, trust that, and because I have agreed to come to your daughter, that the reason uh, for me coming, the solution to your problem, has not yet been taken away by circumstances. So, he, in the, in the, the story of the storm, he, Jesus said he wants to go to the other side. Storm comes up, the disciples panic. He rebukes them for their panic. Why didn't they trust that Jesus said he wanted to go to the other side, that he would get there? Jesus had told Jairus, I will go with you to your daughter. Don't, don't worry. I've said I'm going to go there. I will get there. Do not be afraid. Just believe. And so there's that interplay between human fear and belief, with belief, I think, being associated with godly fear. There's human fear, faith slash godly fear. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. This is the first time uh, this special group of three is separated. So we had the four, the two brothers, Andrew, Peter, James, John, and then the twelve. But this is the first time that we get Peter, James, and John with no Andrew being allowed to witness this event, which is going to be one of the greatest miracles in Mark. When they get there, uh, Jesus saw uh, to the house of the synagogue ruler, they saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly, uh, indication of mourning that had happened. The loudness of it also may indicate there were a lot there. Of course, in this culture, uh, when, when someone died, there was a professional group of mourners you would call upon uh, who would come and, and also mourn with you. That was their sort of vocation. I don't think it's a manipulative vocation. It was something to... Um, uh, just uh, be a part of the community of the moment. And so these mourners that are here, some would have known the family. Others probably would have been paid for to also sort of mourn the death. Um, and so we, we have them, and, and there's this huge commotion and wailing. Uh, it's not, it's again, it's, it's, this environment seems similar to the storm, this out of control um, situation. And Jesus says, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. Uh, and, and some have wondered, is Jesus saying she's in a coma? Uh, and he's, he's technically correct. More than likely, this sleep is um, playing on the reference to how sleep and death, uh, sleep is often a metaphor of death. Um, and so I, don't, I, think, uh, I think Jesus is speaking that uh, she is dead, but um, not in a state uh, uh, of where Jesus can't awaken her. So that I think there's a bit of an interplay that is happening here. I don't think the, the girl's actually asleep, um, but whether the child is not dead in the sense of um, beyond uh, healing. I think that's the, that's the idea. And after he put them all out, of course, the child's not dead, and they laughed at him. Notice that this group goes from crying and wailing and mourning to laughing. I think this immediate switch in emotion might also indicate that they weren't really authentically mourning, but they were paid mourners, uh, and so they can have such an emotional Switch, And I wonder if there's not just a bit of foreshadowing of the mocking that Jesus will receive that's associated with his own death. Uh, and, and, and here, the, the mocking he receives at talking about his power over death 
this girl. And after he had put them out, he, he took the um, child's father and mother and the three who were with him, the disciples, and went where the child was. He took her by the hand and says to her, and we get Aramaic. We don't usually get the Aramaic, but we get the Aramaic, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Actually, it almost means little lamb, I say to you, get up. But little lamb was a um, often pet name used for a, a, a little girl, an intimate um, statement. And immediately the girl stood up, walked around. She was 12 years old. The woman had been bleeding for 12 years. This girl was 12 years old. Uh, the woman, uh, one of, one of um, uh, thought of the interconnection too is at 12 years of age during that culture was about the time you would start being uh, considered for marriage uh, or be, you know, having a family. Uh, and, and so now she's sort of restored to uh, the ability to give birth, to be alive, to have a family, to en- en- enjoy that at 12 years old. The woman had, uh, had menstrual bleeding for 12 years, and now that was also restored, and there is a similar um, uh, relationship there, perhaps, between it. And then uh, at this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders, which I think is an understatement of the year. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told her to give something to eat. It seems um, uh, almost crazy to think that here was a girl who was dead, now alive, and Jesus is telling people not to tell anyone. Um, it, it, again, I think twofold, maybe part of Jesus, again, trying to dampen uh, the fervor that might result. Maybe the instructions have to do is deal with not telling um, anyone how it exactly happened, the restoration I'm not, I'm not sure on that. I do know, though, with it, that Mark creates a literary tension. So throughout, he's been always having these, when something happens, don't tell anyone. When something happens, don't tell anyone. And here seems the most uh, absurd example of don't tell anyone. Here is a dead who's come to life. And, and from a literary standpoint, there's almost this question of when is it okay to tell someone? When, when can we no longer be silenced about what Jesus is doing? Or maybe better put, uh, when do we have a right understanding of who Jesus is so then that we can tell? And at this point, the answer would be, uh, it's not sufficient enough just to know that he, raised, he resuscitated this girl, raised her uh, from death now, now to life. Um, again, building towards what I believe will be the centurion's confession. Now, There's also, it's hard not to miss that throughout this process, his miracles have been talking about the effects of the fall being undone, illness, restoration of the hand, uh, of the uh, demonic possession, and now uh, the ultimate, um, uh, you know, uh, result of the fall being undone, uh, which would be death uh, and, and, and uh, that aspect of it. So we're speaking to an authority that's unlike um, any other authority, an authority that can reverse the fall. And of course, the three here have witnessed it, um, even though the other ones have not. Now, it's fascinating. So we move here from um, Mark chapter 5 uh, and into Mark chapter 6, and, and we'll just barely get into chapter 6, but there is, uh, in, the, in the first six verses, and this will be the extent of, of what we look at, Jesus has been having this great response to him. There's been this uh, huge acceptance uh, in terms of uh, Jesus as a great miracle worker, as a teacher. There's been the faith of uh, the, uh, the, the demoniac who wanted to follow him. There's been the faith of the people who have been sick trying to come and their faith has made them heal. Because your, 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 of your faith, your sins are forgiven. You know, again, we've just been getting this strong, favorable response. And then with chapter 6, perhaps it comes, the story comes back to earth a little bit, if you will, uh, as one commentator put, put it. Um, there's a different response leading up to this series. We, of course, had the calming of the storms and legion, the healing of a woman, and the raising of a girl back to life. But here we get something else, and it happens <coughs> in Jesus' hometown. When uh, Jesus left there, verse 1, went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. 
When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. This, is, this itself is nothing different than we've seen before. Jesus' hometown, of course, is Nazareth. Nazareth is a small village, not mentioned in the Old Testament. Uh, Nathaniel in John chapter 1, verse 46 says, Can anything good come from Nazareth? The disdainful statement. The only reason we know of Nazareth is because Jesus is from there. So he's returned to his hometown. His hometown is not Bethlehem. Bethlehem was where he was born. <coughs> N- uh, Nazareth is where he was raised. Um, and he returns to his uh, hometown um, and we, we, we are ready in chapter, Mar- um, in, in chapter 6 from the Gospel of Mark to, to know this may not be a favorable reception. Remember, his family has already had trouble and difficulty with what Jesus has been doing. We know that from earlier. But so this thing starts out. He is teaching. Uh, they are amazed at his teaching. He's doing it in the synagogue, very reminiscent of how chapter 1 uh, in the day in Capernaum starts out. We get a question, where did this man get these things? Talking about his teaching. What's this wisdom that he has been given, that he even does miracles? Those questions there sound like the questions in the synagogue in Capernaum chapter 1, who was like this, and he had teaching with such authority, and that, you know, that the demons even obey him. You know, those are very, they're amazed. Where is this wisdom coming from? And he even does miracles. Very similar. But then the questions turn a little negative. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So the final two questions here aren't about what he's able to do but they start looking at his local origins and his family relations are stressed. Mary, brother James, Joseph, Judah, Simon. James here is mentioned first. Uh, Most likely he's the oldest, and that is why he is mentioned first. Um, uh, Interesting enough, which we talked about before, James will become a senior leader in the church. So um, uh, here he's being associated as a negative but we know he'll see the risen Jesus and he'll be inspired to write one of the books of the New Testament. Same with Jude. Jude 1 identifies himself as a brother of James. But these, these questions start to have this idea of it's unable to accept how Jesus, who would have been uh, just the son of a carpenter, it's interesting Joseph isn't mentioned by name, Mary is mentioned by name, um, most likely may indicate that there's been a substantial passage of time, perhaps uh, with Joseph's death, and that Jesus was primarily raised um, you know, with Mary. The New Testament is very silent on Joseph after, after the birth narrative and the, and the early childhood. But anyway, this, this, these questions, is, it's absurd. They're offended. Instead of this town being excited that here is this one of their own, doing these amazing things, uh, it almost turns to a question of inability to accept how one of their own would have the audacity to say such things. Very similar to what his family had said earlier uh, in the Gospel of Mark. And then Jesus responds, uh, Jesus said to them, only in his hometown... Among his relatives and his own house is a prophet without honor. Now, some version of this statement is very common throughout the ancient world. Philosophers use it um, as, as well to talk about how they, you know, the, the, these great speakers and thinkers seem to be loved by everyone except the people they come from. Now, the, Jesus identifying himself with a prophet here, uh, we, we shouldn't think of that in terms of uh, did Jesus understand who, who he truly was or not? But actually in terms of the history of the prophets of the Old Testament is that they were rejected by their own, um, that they are you know, continually uh, rejected. And this, of course, will even become more to the, to, to the fact that, they will be, that Jesus will be uh, rejected um, not simply by his hometown and his relatives and his own house, right, the town, well, his house, but also by his people uh, in general. And then, and then you have this very complicated statement. He 
could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Uh, you know, Mark's statement here about could not do miracles, when Matthew, Matthew um, uh, makes it a little more clear that it's not by a lack of ability, but, but of choice. And, and I think that's the sense here, that in Mark, Mark's been telling us that Jesus' miracles are a response to faith. And that they provoke faith, they, they require demonstration of faith. They are, they are um, in relationship to someone making a statement about who Jesus is or what they believe Jesus can do. And the town of Nazareth here is rejecting Jesus. I mean, there's irony, isn't there irony, that uh, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Uh, laying hands on a few sick people and heal them is now a low bar. Uh, in terms of it. it's not that it should have been some great act, but here Mark presents it that some of these amazing things Jesus would do in response to faith, he he won't do. The unbelief of the ones in Nazareth stand in stark contrast, in other words, to uh, Jairus, to uh, the woman with the bleeding disorder, to all the other figures in Mark who have come um, to Jesus for help. It, it also perhaps speaks to uh, an ignorance on the point of the people of Nazareth that they, do, or they were in desperate need of Jesus. Jesus' miracles then, of course, were never then simply a display of his power, but were a part of his design to generate and respond to faith. The, the theme here then being that Nazareth rejection was quite strong and quite sure. That takes us through just the beginning of chapter 6. When we uh, meet again, we will uh, continue to work through chapter 6 and the, the expansion of the public ministry of Jesus. This is Dr. Mark Jennings in his teaching on the Gospel of Mark. This is session number 10 Mark chapter 5, verse 21, through chapter 6, verse 6. Jairus' daughter, rejection at home. 